Good morning. What a beautiful day we have, and I'm reminded of the words of the psalmist who said, and I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. And I am certainly glad to be here, glad that you're here. It's wonderful to be able to come together and to worship uh, our Lord and to be able to encourage one another. And so it's good to see everybody. And, uh, and so we want to begin with a word of prayer for some folks. We want to pray for Charles McLean. Uh, we also want to pray for Joel Wilson, who uh, he called me Wednesday morning, uh, or Wednesday afternoon, I should say, and, and he told me, uh, you'll never guess what happened to me. And uh, he was shot, and he was shot with a gun not far from here, and, and now he's here at church on Sunday. So we're just glad, Joel, that you're okay and, uh, and that you received the care that you needed as quickly as you did. And, and we're thankful that you uh, are here with us. And we just want to pray for you and for your recovery. He was shot in the hip. And uh, thank the Lord that no vital organs were hit. And, and now he's here at church. So we just want to encourage you, Joel. And thank you for being here. And, uh, and I, you know, I look at myself and I say, well, if I got shot on Wednesday, I don't know if I would be here. <laughs> and so thank you for your faith and for your encouragement. We also want to pray for Brenda Fletcher, who just recently had a hip replacement surgery, and she's here as well. And we want to continue to pray for Wayne, which we did receive good news that he is doing well. He's been discharged from the hospital uh, so let's go to God in prayer on behalf of these folks. Lord, we're thankful for Alan, and we just pray for Charles. Uh, we pray for their family, and we just pray your will and for healing and, uh, and for your will to be done. Please bless their family at this time. And Lord, we're thankful for Joel, for his commitment uh, to being here. Uh, he's here week after week. We pray for him, and we pray for his the healing in his hip, and we're just grateful that uh, he is safe and that he uh, that the outcome has been good. And Lord, we just pray you continue to be with him, and, and thank you for his life. And Father, we're thankful also for Brenda for her being here, and we pray for her hip and for the physical therapy. And Lord, we're also thankful for Wayne being safe and, and a safe discharge from the hospital. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for the gift of prayer. And thank you for today. And it's through Jesus we pray. Amen. So some of the things that I'm going to say today may sound a little bit familiar because I was encouraged after last week uh, to kind of complete the sermon. I said, well, I'll just pick up where I was. And then some suggested, hey, just, just start over to make sure we got it all and, uh, and make sure I got it all. And uh, so we're going to start to talk about some of the things that we were talking about last week, which we were talking about the Aramaic sayings of Jesus that are recorded in the New Testament. And, uh, but what we were beginning to talk about was language and meaning and language. And sometimes we may have the words that we want to say, and sometimes this happens to me on Sunday. I think I have the words that I want to say. I think I have the meaning that I want to convey to you guys. And then I get back and I think about it and I say, man, I could have said that better. Why? Because our language doesn't always represent our meaning, does it? And we want our language to reflect the meaning that we're trying to convey. And, and language is that instrument. It is the agency of meaning. Something happened the other day with my daughter. And I was listening to some of her words and she started kindergarten. And of course with kindergarten there comes new relationships and now there's some boys that are interested in her. Yes, there are boys interested in her. And so she comes home and talks about the boys to her mother and I. And so she's talking about some of them, and sometimes she says that she likes some of them more than me. But then, but then the other day she said, don't worry, Daddy. 
don't worry, you're number one. And I said, thank you. She said, but the little boy, he's number zero, which is ahead of you. <laughs> you know, I could have let her just stop at me being number one and I'd have been all right. The meaning that she was trying to give me was different. I was thinking that I was the guy that was in the primary position, right? But actually I wasn't. And meaning and language is so tricky. And we talked about how last week, can you imagine being deprived of your senses? Being deprived of the ability to be able to converse with one another. That we take these things for granted that we can see and that we can hear and that we can touch. But there are some people who don't have the same abilities that we have. And I went to the park a couple of weeks ago and there I saw a girl using FaceTime and she was signing on it. She was conveying the message and think about how wonderful it is that now the phone is accessible to someone who's deaf. And so through the phone, she was conveying the meaning. She was conveying language by signing. She was talking. We think about Helen Keller, who was deprived of both sight and sound. And it just at the age of nine months, went into a dark and silent world. Can you imagine? Can you imagine not being able to see nor to hear? And the frustration it would be to try to communicate, trying to let people know that you're hungry. Trying to let someone know that you're thirsty. Trying to let someone know that you're lonely. And there's no access to the outside world. You can't get to it. Eventually in Helen Keller's life, she was frustrated to the point that she knocked over a crib. And her parents got her a tutor. And they were trying to connect language in her mind. And how would they do it? And the tutor would write the words on her hand. And after months and after weeks of trying to connect the words on the hand with, with objects and with things and with language, it finally happened when the teacher connected the word water with the actual substance of water that she took Helen Keller's hand and put it under the water and then would write on her other hand, W-A-T-E-R, over and over again. And then finally it connected. Finally she recognized that what she was writing on her right hand was reflective of what was happening on her left. And she connected the idea of water, that cool substance, with the symbol, the word, Water. And she wrote, as the cool stream gushed over one hand, she spelled in the other the word water. First slowly, then rapidly, I stood still. My whole attention fixed upon the motions of her fingers. Suddenly I felt a misty consciousness, as if something forgotten, a thrill of returning thought. And somehow, the mystery of language was revealed to me. I knew then what water meant, the wonderful, cool something that was flowing over my hand. That living word awakened my soul, gave it light, hope, joy. It set it free. There were barriers still. It's true, but barriers that could in time be swept away. Think about the world that was open to Helen Keller when she understood language. That all of a sudden those limitations, those things that were inhibiting her, those things that were stopping her, now the world could be understood through the Word. Think about the power of language. We have, in most languages, over a hundred thousand distinct words to be able to describe our existence, to describe ideas, to be able to understand fully What's going on? Language is the agency in which meaning is encoded and then conveyed. The linguist philosopher Noam Chomsky said it like this, at the crudest level of description, we may say that a language associates sound and meaning in a particular way. 
understanding the world through symbols, and that's what language is. It's a symbol, the letter A, a symbol. When you put the words together, it's a symbol for something, isn't it? Just like sign language is a, is a symbol, braille, a symbol for something deeper, for meaning. And what we find in our existence, in our essence, in our lives, is that there is a linguistic underpinning to reality itself. That we can actually understand and predict things by the language of math. How did we figure out how far we were from the sun? Did someone have a, a tape measure? No, it was through the language of math that math is so powerful that we can represent with sig symbols, actual values, and then be able to predict certain things. That's powerful, isn't it? Math. And then not only that, that within the individual, within the person, there is language within your life called DNA. And that even within a simple amoeba, there is a thousand complete sets of encyclopedias worth of information just in that simple life form. Not to mention you and me. Language underpins everything. So there's this meaning that's in our universe. There's this meaning within our lives. There's this meaning everywhere. And it doesn't sit well when there is no God. But it sits perfectly when there is a God. It sits comfortably within Christianity. That's why in Hebrews 11.3 it says this, Listen, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by what? By the Word of God. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. That linguistic underpinning of reality makes sense because God is the author of it. And it was through the Word, through the symbol, through the power, through the intention of God, through the will of God, that we exist even now. So we understand meaning. And C.S. Lewis remarked that if this world and if life was meaningless, which it would be without God, there would be no purpose. It would just be here by sheer accident, by blind processes of chemical over time. Then we wouldn't even figure out that it was meaningless. He said this, listen, if the whole universe has no meaning, we should have never found out that it had no meaning. Just as if there was no light in the universe and there, therefore no creatures with eyes, we should never know it was dark. Dark would be without meaning. Meaningless would be without meaning if there was no meaning. But the fact is we understand that there's purpose. We understand intentionality. We understand meaning and language. And that's why God is a speaking God. God is a writing God. God is a personal God communicating to you and I. That's who He is. That He wants to know you and for you to know Him. And that's why He sent His Son Jesus. And the message of God is conveyed through the words and language of Jesus Christ. That's why it says in Hebrews 2, 3, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard Him? The Lord has spoken. And it's through His words, it's through His meaning that we understand ourselves and salvation. That's why Jesus says that whosoever hears these words and does these words is likened unto a wise man who builds his house upon a rock. God is conveying meaning to you. He wants you to understand the message. And the words of Jesus matter. Listen to what Jesus says in John 12, 28. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. 
The word which I have spoken will judge you in the last day. These words that Jesus has spoken will judge us. Sometimes we like to think of the words of Christ as the words in red, right? The words in red, they represent His earthly words that He uttered on earth in His ministry. But the Bible tells us that the words are actually, all of the words in the, in the Bible are His words. That when He talks about the Old Testament, when He talks about Moses, He says, these are they which testify of Me. And so Jesus' words are not just limited to the letters in red. No, the whole Bible is God's revelation to us. Paul said that my gospel that I have received, I haven't received it from any man. I received it directly by revelation of Jesus Christ. So that when you read the words of Paul the Apostle in the epistles, you're reading the words of Christ relayed through Paul the messenger. But today I want us to look at a few statements that are very unique in the New Testament representing Jesus' ministry. And what they are, it's very interesting because the Bible is written in three different languages, right? Three different languages. You have the Old Testament written in Hebrew. You have some of it written in Aramaic. And then you have the New Testament primarily written in Greek. And so, but what's interesting is that Jesus, in most of His ministry, He spoke the language of Aramaic. And so, the reason why the New Testament is written in Greek is because that was the universal language. If you were going to read a book in the first century, it would be written in Greek because that's what the world spoke. It's what they call the lingua franca. It's basically what everybody's speaking. And so the reason why the New Testament is conveyed in Greek is because that's what people read. Just like if you come to this country, you're going to see road signs in English, right? It's what we read. And if you're going to write something, then it's going to be written in English. It's the lingua franca of America. And Greek was the lingua franca of the first century. But what's interesting in the New Testament is that you have these specific Aramaic sayings that are preserved in Scripture. So I want us to look. There's seven of them recorded in the New Testament. So why do you think that they recorded them in Aramaic? It's because they were showing the vividness and the realness of Christ. They, they are recording His actual language during these events. And what's interesting too is it's, it's supernatural events. That when they're, when they're describing Jesus in His life, they're using the Aramaic sayings not when He's just doing normal things, but it's when He is raising people from the dead and healing people. It speaks to the veracity and truth of Jesus' supernatural ministry. The first one is found in Mark chapter 541, which is the raising of Jairus' daughter. And what's interesting about this story in Mark chapter 5 is that it describes Jairus as a ruler of the synagogue. He's a leader. He's a ruler. But where do we find him? It says very quickly that Jairus is at the feet of Jesus. Isn't that interesting? That this important person, this wealthy man, this respected man, where is he? He's at the feet of Jesus. You know why? Because his daughter is at the point of sickness unto death. That she's dying. And there is no other answer for her, for him. And he's humbled. He's brought to the feet of Christ. It goes through the story and Jesus is, is trying to get to this guy's house and on the way he heals somebody else. The woman that had an issue with her blood and she, she grabs the hem of Jesus' garment. Remember, he's on the way to Jairus' house. And when he gets to the house, the people say this, why trouble the teacher any further? Your daughter is dead. 
End of story, right? If any other preacher is coming to your house, if any other teacher is coming to your house, the story's over, isn't it? But not so with Jesus. Not so with Jesus. And instead of stopping at the door and moving on, Jesus goes into the house. He brings Peter, James, and John into the house with Him. And then it gives this Aramaic saying that is recorded in Scripture. Why? Because the disciples were there. They were hearing it. And it records it. It says, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, arise. And what do you think happened? It wouldn't be much to write about if it didn't happen, right? (coughs) She got up. Jesus has the power over death. Jesus has the power over death. Why did that teacher, why did that chief ruler, why was he at his feet? Why did Jesus not stop at the door when He was told? Because Jesus has the power over death and no one else, no other thing in this world has that. You can go look for it in pharmaceutical drugs. You're not going to find it. You can go try to find the fountain of youth. You're not going to find it. There's only one person that has the power over death and that is Jesus of Nazareth. Remember when Jesus came to Lazarus' house, He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in Me, though he may die, he shall live. Do you like to live? The Gospel is about life. The Gospel isn't about a graveyard. The Gospel is about overcoming the graveyard. And we see that in a very real way in the ministry of Jesus that He could speak life into a dead girl's body. And that He Himself in His own resurrection overcame death. And guess what? That's what the church is. The church is a group of living beings with the hope of eternal life. The church represents people that have one foot in this moment and one foot in eternity. That's why Paul says he's called us to sit together in heavenly places You're not only here on earth, but you're in the kingdom of God, the eternal kingdom of God. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades, the gates of death, shall not overcome it. So the cemetery isn't the end for you and me. It's not. If you obey Christ, if you believe in Christ, if you allow His atoning life and death and resurrection to be active in your life, these words apply to you. Little girl, arise. What else did Jesus say? It's another healing story in Mark chapter 7, 34. And it's a deaf and mute man in the Decapolis. And He comes to him and He says to this deaf man, Ephetha, which means be opened. And at that moment, his ears were opened. He was able to hear. How does Christ heal us today? He opens our ears to the truth, doesn't He? That the world has its ears closed, but when it hears the truth of who God is, and when it hears the truth of Jesus, the ears are open. Jesus said it like this in John 18, 37. Everyone who is of the truth hears My voice. Will you listen to the words of Christ? The third saying, the third word that's used in Aramaic, the language of Christ that's recorded that way, is in Mark chapter 14, 36. Now I want you to hear this. See if you recognize it. Abba, Father, All things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but what you will. And what we know about the word Abba is that it was the most intimate 
of words applied to a father on earth. That when a little boy, what he would call his father in Aramaic, in the Jewish language, and in everyday life, a term of endearment, a term of intimacy, he would call his father Abba. And Jesus is praying this prayer, this prayer of humiliation because He's in the garden and He knows what lies in front of Him. But not only has Christ ushered in this intimacy, He shows us the submissiveness of a son, doesn't He? You see, Christ brings reconciliation to us that not only is God this distant thing out there, but no, He's your Abba, He's your Father, He loves you. You know, there's different rival ideas about who God is and what He is, right? Some people tell you that God is just some sort of force within the universe, kind of like Star Wars. May the force be with you. It's real personal. Or God's everything, called pantheism. Or God's just some transcendent thing that we can never understand or, or have in our lives. But when Jesus tells you about who God is, He says... God is Abba. He's your dad. He's your father. He loves you. And in that moment in the garden, not only do we see that intimacy, but we also see that responsibility to our Father. That Jesus submits His will to His, even though His will is a cross. Paul said it like this, For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. That you, because of Christ, have the same relationship to God as Jesus had. Abba. What else does the Bible say about these Aramaic artifacts that are recorded for us. Matthew 5.18 it's in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says this, For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. That word jot and tittle is the Aramaic saying. It represents the smallest stroke in the Hebrew language. That's a high view of Scripture, isn't it? You want to know why I believe the Bible's true? Well, for one reason is, is that Christ believed that the Bible's true. So much so, He said that even the smallest little mark in God's Word will not pass away at all. That every mark in the Word is there for a reason and has been preserved for a reason. Jesus said it about this in His own way, in His own words, that heaven and earth shall pass away, but My words by by no means will pass away. God's Word is eternal. He said, the Word shall not be broken. People talk about the Bible as archaic, as as old, old news. But yet people are still talking about it today, aren't they? People are still reading it. People are still coming to it, yearning for life because that's what it is. Not one jot or tittle shall pass away from the Word. Another saying comes from the same Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 22, when Jesus says this, But I say unto you that whoever is angry with his brother with cause shall be danger of judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka shall be in danger. That word Raka, it's not a good word. So what's Jesus trying to tell us? He's trying to tell us that your words are powerful, aren't they? Not only is His words powerful, but the words that you use every day. And, and sometimes we misuse our words. We abuse our words and we abuse people in the process, don't we? If all of a sudden your conversations become name-calling, what do you think Jesus is trying to tell you? But yet so many of our conversations have become name-calling, haven't they? Okay, if you don't believe me, let's talk about politics. 
I'm sure some of you got some choice words and some choice names about some people out there, right? But Jesus says, be careful how you use your words. Don't attack people. Don't name call. Are we talking about people or are we talking about ideas? Know the difference. Paul said it like this, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. Love that verse. Are you imparting grace to the people that hear you? Or is it poison? Is it raka? Thou fool, you empty-headed person, that's what it meant. Some of you call me that. Just kidding. Another word comes from the same sermon, Matthew 6, 24. And Jesus says this, No no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God. And here's the word, mammon. It's the Aramaic word for what? Money. Jesus talks about money a lot in the Gospels. And if you had a preacher that talked about money as much as Jesus had, you might not even want him around. But why did Jesus talk about mammon? Why did he talk about money? It's because it competes with him. It competes with God's will because ultimately we run our lives after it so much. And then instead of loving God with all of our heart, mind, and soul, it becomes about things and stuff and mammon. Jesus said, take heed and beware of covetousness for a man's life consists not in the things in which he possess. Your life is not about your clothes. Your life is not about your car. Your life is not about your house. But yet we act like we, it is. Mammon. And then lastly, it's recorded both in Mark and Matthew, it's that phrase that Jesus on the cross says, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Do you think Jesus said that? I think he did. Because why else would they record something like that? <laughs> He's quoting Psalms chapter 22. But if you were just to read that passage, you would say that sounds like a desperate man, doesn't it? That sounds like a man that's hurting. That sounds like a man that's in need. It was spoken by Jesus on a cross. It was spoken by a man who was humiliated, who was tortured. It was spoken by a man that was standing in your place, in my place. It says that Christ in 2 Corinthians 5.21, for He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Why was Jesus so far away from the Father? It's because my sins separated Him. And Jesus was alienated. Jesus was taken away. Jesus was standing in that chasm of separation between humanity and God. He was the bridge. He was standing in that empty space to connect us with our Father. My God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken me? The reason He was forsaken is because He was standing with us. He was no longer standing with the Father. He was standing with us sinners. That's why Paul says that when I glory, I'm not going to glory in anything except the cross of Christ because it was Christ who stood in my place. It is Christ's obedience. It's His submission. Only He is capable of standing in that place and saving me. So what is God trying to communicate to us? 
He's trying to communicate that He loves us. But He's also trying to communicate something to the world outside of this place, isn't He? And in the the lesson that we read, or in the Scripture we read this morning, 2 Corinthians 3, 2 and 3, it's one phrase, you are manifestly an epistle of Christ. You know what the most powerful message to the world is? It's when we are the epistle in our life. And when we are the letter. Can you imagine that? Think about this book. It's been sold seven billion times. Everybody's got a Bible, don't they? We think about how great it is we revere the Bible, but God says, I want to use your life as a letter. Then not only am I trying to send the message through a book, I want to send the message through your life. Think about how, what an honor that is to be the message of Christ to a dying world. And Christ wants to use your life, your letter, to show His joy, to show His love, to show His holiness. And what an awesome responsibility that is. You are manifestly an epistle, a letter of Christ Himself. What message are we sending? What message am I sending in my life? Someone once said that some of us are the only gospel some people will ever read. So what is that gospel? Is it the gospel of Christ? Is it the gospel of freedom? Is it the gospel of salvation? We have the the responsibility to convey that love and that trust to a dying world. Will you begin to do that today? The Bible says there is meaning in this life. In fact, it starts with God. That's why it says in the beginning was the Word and the Word was God. The reason why there's meaning is because God intended for there to be meaning and purpose to our lives. And He says that we have to respond to Him in faith. We have to believe just as Jesus told Jairus. He said, believe only. Have faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And repent of sin. Those things that crucified Christ are the things that we want to turn from. We talk about forgiveness. We talk about God forgiving us. And sometimes we're flippant with that. Oh, God will forgive me. But remember the price that was paid for your forgiveness. It was in the blood of Christ. There's nothing flippant about that, is there? Confess Jesus for who He is. He is the Son of God. He died for you. He ushers in this moment to where we can call God Father. And be baptized into His name. (laughs) Baptized into His church. Or maybe you're a Christian this morning and and your life hasn't been the epistle of Christ. It's been the epistle of you. It's been the letter of you. We want to give you an opportunity to renew yourself. Or if you need encouragement or prayer, we want to sing this next song to encourage you. So if you have any need, won't you come now as together we stand and as we sing.